Hi everyone. So in our fourth instalment um, of um, me talking to Michael Pierce, um, yeah. Uh, hi Michael. How, how has everything been with you? Oh, it's, everything's been good. Everything has been overall good. I'm enjoying graduate school. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going for my uh, philosophy masters, yeah. and uh, then I'll move on to a PhD. So it's a two-year program. So yeah, I'm just getting settled in. I enjoy my apartment. Um, it's uh, it's a small little place, but I like it, and I'm liking the classes, and I'm uh, 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 getting 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 along well enough with the other grad students. So um, so we're figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> and how and so what have you been looking at in your philosophy classes oh um well in the classes the the three classes i'm taking are one is essentially a cognitive science mm. and philosophy class um and he's uh the the professor is very interested in things like the rubber hand illusion if you've ever heard of that um and uh, proprioception and oh have you never heard of that no, not the rubber hand. Tell me about the rubber hand. Oh, the rubber hand illusion is, uh, it's int I, we actually tried it out in class because I got a hold of a rubber hand because I wanted to know what would happen. Oh, when, I've kind of heard of this actually. Yeah, you might, you've probably heard of this. It's become pretty famous. So it, it but for those who don't know, it's where you, um, you set it up so that the, the individual can't see their actual hand, usually their left hand or right hand, whatever it is. Um, they can't see their actual hand and you place instead in a clever way a fairly realistic rubber hand that mm. you know is meant to resemble their real hand even though it, it doesn't have to be perfect so they see that instead of their real hand more or less where their real hand should be and then yeah. what you do is you stroke both the real hand and the and the fake hand uh synchronously at the same time so that they are both getting visual information but they're getting visual information of the tactile sensation and what tends to happen, and it's interesting seeing who who tends to be more susceptible to it and to what extent it is involuntary or them sort of having to decide to give in to the illusion, almost like hypnosis. But um, what generally happens to some degree or other is they start to mistake on a weird unconscious level the rubber hand for their real hand. They will start yeah. to feel as though the rubber hand is is where the the sensation is occurring as though it is shifted over it's a very interesting it's a very interesting um illusion and then what you can do is you know it's really working for them if when you you keep doing this and then suddenly you smack on the rubber hand and then <laughs> and you know it's worked when they go ah! <laughs> <laughs> because because if you smack down on it and they don't and they don't jump like you because you would think that people yeah. might jump if you if you hit in general but people do not re react the same way if it's been if it's working versus when it's not working it's um so it it it's happened it happened on one of the occasions i was doing it that i actually i moved i needed to move the rubber hand but i chose in order to keep the illusion i moved the rubber hand and the real hand at the same time and i just happened to do it just right that the person was like whoa <laughs> whoa like it really solidified the illusion for them because i just the tactile was just right in how i did it so anyway that's oh, stuff that's like that fun. is uh is uh what we've been talking about um and then there's a meta ethics class which is basically just an advanced ethics course um it's talking about um like uh, uh different theories of the grounding of ethics like ge moore's um notion of of the good being an objective property or um that's what or the notion of error theory um it would take a while to kind of explain i'm still wrapping my head around all of it um and then the last class is a class on aristotle so good old classic, classic uh, philosophy there. So, no, that's cool. And for, for Aristotle, is that in like in vir into virtue ethics, or is it something uh, something else? Oh, um, the Aristotle class. We've been focusing more on. Um, uh, we've been focusing on his. Well, <laughs> see, the problem is that the professor, uh, bless his soul, um, <laughs> I suspect is is NTP. Yeah. Um, but particularly 
He's a very jolly fellow, very, very smart, and cannot stay on topic. So yeah. it's always very interesting, but he, he'll he just, he'll go over here and over here and over here, and he'll just sort of be following following the train. Um, I suppose it's possible he might also be an NI type, but he's definitely a, a, a perception intuitive type. Um, what's that? Very tangential. It's hard very, to- yeah. He, he, he doesn't quite figure out, okay, is the thing I'm going to offer to this class actually relevant to the lesson plan, or is it something <laughs> which is very interesting and like to see them react to it? Ex- exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, he just, he just, and he has a lot of knowledge to share, but that's why it's kind of hard to determine exactly what it's about. It's always about Aristotle, yeah. but... Um, There's a lot to Aristotle, so... I yes, guess so it's mm. fair enough. But yeah, so we've been focusing on the, um, we read the posterior analytics and the categories and um, uh, the metaphysics. Mm. And uh, we've also been reading a book by a um, acclaimed scholar in philosophy of science named Lennox. Um, Mm. I can't remember his first name, um, but uh, he wrote a book, a recent book about Aristotle that we've also been focused on. And the book has to do with Aristotle's method and trying to show that Aristotle's method is, does not change from book to book, but is actually unified. And there's a lot of technical aspects of it that um, See. I'm wrapping my head around. But anyway, he's, he's a sort of philosopher who writes on other philosophers. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I suppose that's a lot of philosophy these days, to be honest. Yes. Um, and, and which, uh, so, John, I, mean, I, I just did a little Google John Lennox. Um, um, let me. I'll I'll do a Google real quick too. Lennox Aerotech. The name of the book was, I believe, Aerotechnic Frameworks. Um, yeah. Yeah, Arista, James G. Lennox. Oh, J. Oh, James. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, James. James Lennox. Yeah. Nah. Um, yeah, Aerotechnic Frameworks. Though he, there's, he's done a number of articles. He did one article that I still haven't read, but I'm very interested in, where he was arguing that, um, and it was more of a historical scholarship piece rather than a philosophical piece, because he was arguing not just philosophically, but like historically from reading Darwin's notebooks that Darwin was actually a teleologist and believed in, in ends, which is not how he is characterized these days. Again, I want to read the article to make sure, but I was very curious to, to know where he was getting at with that. Cause that, um, well, yeah, that's, that's very interesting because there has been some debate around the type of Darwin, actually. Um, oh. The consensus is... That's right. That he is um, an I, you know, an ITJ, as it were. Right. The, the big thing, ILI or SLI, the main point of contention was whether he was an SLI or an ILI. Right. And the, right. I think some people were thinking, no, he was doing it, the, the whole crux of the argument as to whether he's one or the other, is if he was put, piecing together this theory purely through observations and seeing it in terms of each organism making adaptations. Or, well, I guess actually it wasn't organism. That's actually a good point, actually. You know, Lamarckian view was about the organism making adaptations. It right. was Darwin is actually saying, no, it's more about they just don't live. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then see the trends over time from living versus not living. Um so if he is teleological in his view, that kind of solidifies the point around yeah. Darwin being introverted intuition leading rather than introverted sensation, which actually should cause me to revise my opinion. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I'll have to, well, and I'm sure you could probably find it too if you look up like a Lennox Darwin. I'm sure you'd probably find it. Um, I but I, I've wondered about that too. I've usually tended towards... Um, uh, I, INTP, I'm trying to translate that to socionics in my head. I really should practice this so I can sound more learned, but um, <laughs> that would be, uh, shoot, wait, that would that would be um, L, L, I, L, I, I for INTP, logical, intuitive, introvert. 
it, it most of the time that does translate across but yeah right um, most of the i should, I should clarify that across yes c-i-n-e yes and yes. so you're saying that for whom for, for darwin or for Lenin? uh for darwin um ah. i i had thought and i know that that um the burden of proof is a little bit more on me because of the the way in which darwin seems to have him employed proof because of his listing lots of facts and things like that but um uh and maybe some of it is just intuition on my part but i i do agree that if if he was um more if he genuinely was more teleological i do think that would push things more in the direction you're saying um yeah. or lend lend towards that view he, he's an interesting he's an interesting yeah. case what well, one thing i will say though and looking at Jung's work now, I'm not the sort of person who says whatever Jung says is is the writ, is the writ of the Lord, as it were, because it isn't. But what what I do think is that many of his observations are correct. Yes, yeah. large majority. To the point where he he used he deliberately used Darwin as an example as the extroverted thinking type. He did, and and I and I think he is. I, I do agree with you on that point that Darwin's main focus was less about a priori um, um, rationalizations and more about data collection and right. looking through the facts external to himself to to reach a judgment in terms of how is this working, what this process is. That That's why I was considering, um, that's one of the reasons why I think an ITJ would have made more sense than ITP. But right. well, why, why did you think? Why do you think I, 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 ITP rather than ITJ? Ha! <sighs> I'm going to see if I can explain myself here, mm. but I fear it. It. Um, I think it comes more so when, for example, when I read his writing, um, mm. he and his his writing style, and also seeing the way in which. It, it definitely is the case that he lists a great deal of facts, though to me, it feels as though, for one, there's always a, um, I, I don't know to what extent that is actually a, I don't want to say a front, because that would imply dishonesty, which isn't the case. He is genuinely looking at the facts, but there's an element where I rather suspect some of his ideas came first and then he he in more of the introverted thinking way that Jung describes that he he did fit the facts to a very fruitful theory namely the notion of the the tree of life spreading out um and i that's probably a controversial view but and it's also just the reading his writing style um and maybe this isn't the most objective thing he he doesn't he doesn't demonstrate the the directness or the um, even harshness that I tend mm. to associate with with the ITJs um, or with extroverted thinking. Um, he seems much more. He seems to re almost revel in his humility in a way that I know that's a weird expression, but in a way that I tend to associate where he you know he's sort of jumps over hoops a little bit to to emphasize i am you know not the end all there is this is not a complete work this is you know i i owe all of this debt to all these people in a way that you'll see i suppose with itjs but they're not as forthcoming with that because they're much more possessive of their ideas i think mm. um but i don't know um because I, I, so in a way, it's because I, I can definitely see that effect in someone like Thomas Aquinas. Sure. For instance, like I can see that idea. He had his principles already in place and he was using Aristotle to justify his opinions. One of the reasons why right. I think Aquinas is definitely an INTP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think when it comes to Darwin, now that question around the harshness side and the sort of almost sort of slightly arrogant uncouthness <laughs> one could expect to some. Now, okay. I'm thinking about partly time and place, 19th century. That's and that true. Sort of, those formalities and the idea of being humble. I mean, he was raised Christian. Right. He was raised with, um, and particularly it was that more sort of Protestant style of Christianity of the 19th century, which is 
does look to, towards humbleness and you know a, a mixture of self reliance, but also being grateful to what you know you, you right. have, has been given to you as well. Um, I wonder about the effect of other people in his life as well in terms of him writing it. Also, I think there's and one of the reasons why I wondered more about ISTJ rather than INTJ. ISTJ is right. less possessive. I think, as I said, as we discussed earlier, they're a bit less on the extreme end of the individual, the individualism um, side. Yeah. You know, actually, I've I've never really considered um, ISTJ, which would be um, mm. S uh, S L I, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I sorry, I keep doing the translation thing because I'm like trying to communicate with you, but that's but, all right. I, I, I but. Uh, I, I could oh, because I'm sort of bilingual. I'm happy to move between. But, okay. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I've never really considered that. But that's actually that could be a nice way of um, uniting some of the things that I've noticed with with a more TE type because that, in some sense, that's kind of uh, uh, a middle between the INTP and and the NTJ types. Yes. You know, in in kind of bringing both of those sides together, you get the same kind of, and in fact, it could help to explain um, the apparent meticulousness of uh, in in his works, where he's going through fact after fact after fact in a way that um, that I, I actually would think in an NTJ they'd be more likely to to summarize and skip over things more. And get straight to to the ideas and the essences, whereas definitely with an ISTJ, they they are they're more likely to be very careful. Nice. And and it's that for me, it's that it's that um, SI the introverted sensation, especially mixed with extroverted thinking. Um, but uh, that's an interesting idea. So I'm not I'm not. It's like a, I had typed him as ISTJ. Right. I am open to being wrong on that, especially in this point about teleology being right. Ration for Darwin. So if that's the case. That is more strong supporting INTJ. Also, I'm considering considering rather similar figures of the well, I say the late 19th century, early 20th century, and that still in that age of right extreme politeness. Right. Can, well, such, such as Niels Bohr. Oh. <laughs> Now, how do, how do you had? I don't know if we've discussed this before. How do you type Niels Bohr? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, most likely an INTJ, but okay. he seems to have none of that kind of you know arrogance to him. What what I know is this: he was the sort of slow plodding thinker who would suddenly trip up someone like Einstein. In discussion, he'd come up yes. with something from a completely different angle that would that would sort of turn it over. He seemed to relish very much in contradictions. Yes, he liked the idea of things being contradictory yes. in his thinking, and it just seemed that his style seemed more like the INTJ sort of style. But when you read through him, he doesn't have any of that sort of uncouthness. Right again. A bit, a bit like Darwin, you could say, and that sort of actual right. graciousness to his style, and so that again makes me wonder, you know, is it that he's just been well brought up and he knows what his manners are, and he knows what he's meant to say in this situation and that situation, which I think, to some degree, was perhaps quite common of that time. So that that's what I'm wondering about. If you were to yeah. go before that, if you were to go before that age of sort of politeness to say the 18th century. Or even the the, the late the late seventh, and you get you get to the early eighteenth century or late seventeenth century. Someone like Isaac Newton, you know, you're right, right. back, you're right back in rude territory. <laughs> or <laughs> a bit before, like the very early nineteenth century, you have writings or characters like, um, well, like Heathcliff, who I think is right. the epitome of the sort of supercharged fictional INTJ. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I, I for a moment I was thinking of another, of another Heathcliff. I, um, but no, you're talking about Wuthering Heights. Yes. Um, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, tall, tall, dark, brooding, handsome. Yes. Um, 
which is hilarious because I had a I had an INTJ friend who fit all of those categories and <laughs> it's like he he sent out pheromones or something is <laughs> just instantly it was very yeah, INTJ um, I mean, he's very not, interesting he's not really realistic he's like the INTJ right. turned into a superman yeah, right. <laughs> right. Her sensation problems are there anymore. Right. It's like he's he's taken some sort of drug. Um, <laughs> it basically, but he's definitely showing the harsh judgment right. and the the introverted ethics fixation with right disregard of extroverted ethics, which right. is classic to that INTJ figure. Right. Um, but yeah, all the, the extra sensation problem is not there. Instead, characters who should be tougher are made a lot more fragile and frail. Well, he's the one who's still alive right at the end right. of it. Right. Right. I don't have follow-up comments there, but that's interesting. Now, I was talking about a friend, Rita. You, you, you need to meet Rita one day. She's very... She's very yeah. Sonics and... She's very into literature, and she's she's one of those people who has sort of like a deeply penetrative insight into a character before you can come up with the reasons for why that is the case. Right. And then we get to discuss it, and you realise actually she was right all along. It takes right, it. right. And she's the one who's like okay, we we're talking about this. I was thinking, yeah, I, I could see it makes sense for Heathcliff. But why are the other characters so strangely weak? It's just <laughs> right. By yeah. the way, that I mean, that's one of the reasons I've I've always considered myself introverted intuition is that mm. I I ha it's it's like a problem. I'll see it and then I have mm. to go back and work my way up. Like you saw yeah. it to a certain extent with with my typing. I'm like, well, I think he just feels and tastes like an INTP to me, mm. and then it's like, but crap, I need to come up with reasons because <laughs> I can't just speak it forth like the prophet of Delphi. You know, it's, it's like I gotta work back. Be like, how do I justify this other than just, well, it just, he just looks like it. And that's a problem I've been trying to overcome. I can talk because I can do the introverted yeah. thinking work of being like, here's the system. But then when I'm actually trying to recognize and type people, I always yeah. trip up over the fact that my, it's how I would describe it as my introverted intuition kicks into gear then. And it's it's mm. very difficult to actually shift the TI system over it because then I can't really make the decisions very well. That's how but, I would normally describe it. But I get it too. Like I get quite strong heuristics, right? And what well, and I guess one of the heuristics are very powerful in getting, allowing people to type quite quickly. Yeah. But at the same time, where the heuristics are wrong. People can then sort of abandon their responsibility to ch check the heuristic, and sometimes right. they'll reach for the first piece of evidence which supports the heuristic and run with it, and forget the bits which actually, you know, actually contradict it. But it's something which I've experienced quite a lot. Yeah, right? I've been trying to crack, keep, keep, keep trying to think. Okay, how can I really, um, you know, make sure this is fail proof? Right. And it's uh, it, it, that can be quite hard to do. I think there's a natural desire to run with the perception of clarity. Yeah. Hey, in in fact, I uh, I think that happened with me, and I I almost feel bad saying this because I still haven't. Well, it, I haven't fixed it because I haven't checked more through the facts. But I did a typing of Max Sterner on the. Um, on the personality database, actually, which yeah. I think, I think, oh, on the personality database. Yes. Um, yeah, I did. I, um, I wrote a comment there explaining it. And uh, I, I know a fair number of people have seen it, but um, uh, another fellow made a comment that was bringing up some, I feel like I, I might have jumped into that one too quickly because I typed him as INTJ. Yeah. And I think because of, of the, I just, I picked up on that. He's very forthright in, in especially just in that, those first few chapters in the ego on its own. And I'm just kind of like, this just feels like an INTJ writing. And I think I might've jumped the gun because I think it's more complicated. Someone, I, I, it's been a while and I need to look at the comment again, but um, someone had was sort of bringing up a few of other things that he said. And as I've thought about it, I'm kind of like, you know, mm. He might have. I might. I might be putting way too much weight on the notion of the 
of the harshness of tone. Um, I, I think that might not be as good a, a heuristic as it were, as I've, I've been using because it's, it's, because I think you can get, you can get crossover there. So I need to, I need to take a look at Max Turner. I've been lazy and I haven't gone, gone back to do that. I've been busy with graduate school. That's yes, why. But, uh, yeah. I'm sure you've been busy. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've been, my celebrity typing and historical figure typing has sort of taken, gone by the wayside since been working on the course. But oh. I know, when I think about Sterner, I think, okay, there is good reason to think that he'd lean towards gamma because it's clearly his philosophy is highly individualistic. Right. Um, and if you look at other sort of more individualistic philosophers like Ayn Rand, for instance, she'd be, I'd say, an ENTJ. Right. Um, right. Um, when it comes to, I wouldn't say I know enough about Sterner to, to really right. have interrogated this typing. I think if not INTJ, and if not a gamma type, maybe he could be something like an LSI, be like the IST, oh. perhaps. So that harsher yeah. edge, I think, is probably what you picked out as being accurate and true. Right. Another sort of harsh, intellectually driven sort of type would be that sort of ISTP. Um, and perhaps, I guess the real question for him, for his, for his type, is whether he's pragmatic in this or if it is derived predominantly from principles. And right. if I look at another sort of INTJ um, socio-political philosopher, I'd be thinking of someone like Machiavelli. Um, oh. And you know, he's often typed ENTP by people because they make you seem like a sort of devil's advocate, turning things on his head, right. all that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, he was someone who was very much a political actor behind the scenes. Right. You got to see all the real sort of, you know, the big beasts, as it were, in that in that, um, in that Italian Renaissance politics, and then he's kind of reached a position where he had to get he almost got into trouble. He needs to sort of withdraw from all the sort of problems. And at that point, when he's sort of more reclusive, he started to write his books. So maybe he can you know, right. write what he learned about. And these were sort of pragmatic lessons for right. how someone based on his experience would have gotten ahead, and how that right. would have worked. So it's actually quite extroverted logic driven rather than introverted logic. it wasn't about principles it was more like guidelines based on past experience of praxis um, right yeah because i i've usually leaned towards entp um uh if only because of of but it's not like i've really looked into it um and it is interesting that um uh what was i gonna say um well i can't remember I had a, I had a, I was going to say something very brilliant, I'm sure, but um, <laughs> it, it was. Um, I'll I'll remember it later if it's important. I don't want to hold things up, but though actually, I think this might have been it. That that is a nice um, transition into something else. I do I did want to talk about, which was to to talk a little bit about um, the thing we were talking about last time, which is. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know what you'd call it. The uh, the the I've made that one video about the yes. the seven dichotomies and sort of ah. you had created that spreadsheet and I was I was trying to do my homework as it were and and think uh -huh. think more about that so that we could discuss it a bit. But the point I the initial point I wanted to make was that I I do I still stand by the principles of my referring to the to the alpha quadrant as the as the democratic types I, I stand by the principles of that but i i and i've thought it for a while i do definitely agree that there's something misleading in 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 the way i presented it because particularly you can argue more easily that the sfj types can can come across as as more accommodating and conforming and wanting especially the esfj you know that's sort of a very typical thing they they're very democratic in the way that people think of democratic yeah. of pooling every it's there there's something missing when you try to describe the the ntp types that yeah. way even though i was i tried to bridge that gap by arguing well it's not so much a social thing it's that they're looking for universal principles but then you also have a lot of NTP 
types who, when I would say things like that in my INTP video, for example, and they're like, well, I'm a moral nihilist or I'm a relativist or whatever. <laughs> there are a lot of people who yeah. are very insistent on this. And I was like, at the time, I was like, well, and I still stand by this in a sense, uh, it's like, well, but that's a universal position of yours. And that's how I got out of it. But anyway, that's... No, it, that's but, 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 no, I don't, when you say you still stand by the principle, I, I don't think I've challenged that in you. I think I agree with you. Yeah. The alphas are very much lean towards that democratic sort of type. Yeah. That is their collectivism. And it's a sort of very horizontal collectivism of reaching a consensus. Yes. Getting people on board and not wanting anyone to feel excluded from the decision that's made. Right. It's it's almost extreme. Not wanting any aristocratic exceptions that, yes. you know, like you're not special. You have to find principles that don't just say i i get to cut in line because i am the best man like a heraclitus yeah. or someone might say so yes. I, in that sort of sense but, yes and it is almost more extreme than democracy it's almost they want unanimity right a disagreement is a blemish on the decision right right even though you know you have the you do have the devil's advocate notion of oh, yeah. of with the, but in some sense, that is more in order to produce more fairness, because it's like you want, it's like, well, everybody seems to be on this, on this side. Well, somebody needs to say the other side so we can reach more of, you know, to complete yes. the circle, you know. Um, exactly. It's the idea that the vote, the actual vote should be as far off in the future as possible. <laughs> <laughs> we want as much time given to the discussion. Right. Of, abilities and uh, with everyone people playing devil's advocate all the rest of people should be free to do that so that eventually when we do reach have our final vote everyone's in agreement because we've explored all the possibilities right uh, so it's very much like a very extreme very slow consensus seeking sort of democracy so, yes. but, but the problem is and this is where i was talking about sort of asking declaring uh, right is that when you go to ntps NTPs don't necessarily start off with their collectivism. They start off kind of thinking they're meant to be individualists or feeling like they're individualists. And it's only through growth do they realize they're actually collectivists all along. So right. you find lots of young INTPs and ENTPs saying they're nihilists. I, I, I believe I've gone through the journey as well. I, I, I used to like Max Sturler for a while for a similar sort of reason, but... Wow. I, I went through a whole philosophical journey. I had to sort of put together my morality through constructing my principles because I didn't find that the way morality was taught in school or in society was anywhere near sufficient to defend the morality which people seemed to follow. It just right. seemed to be like some sort of weird groupthink. Uh, it was only after a, a, lo a long period of time I started to recognize the collectivistic value of it. Right. So, and even now, I wouldn't say I'm your tip. I'm a left winger, but most you find most NTPs, especially you know famous ones, Einstein, for instance, or a number right. of these, Noam Chomsky, they end up quite right. left wing. Um, and I think there is a when I did even I've done surveys of people on my group in terms of what are your leanings politically, although the overall drive was towards the left because talking to young people on the internet. Nevertheless, out of them, the alphas were more frequently to the left and the gammas are more frequently to the right in, in relative to each right. other. And we, I tend to see philosophers who are more right wing. When I say right wing, I mean more sort of, you know, libertarian. Right. It, but even then, like there are exceptions like Ron Paul, for instance. Right. I, I mean, more of a sort of market oriented libertarian who's like right we need to keep the markets free we need to um um Mil the milton friedman's yes the thomas souls yes the uh, again the ayn rands the, um the hayek's all these sorts of people are going to be in gamma ron paul would be a clear exception to that he'd be definitely more in the alpha group he's more principles driven a bit more like a uh, a Bernie Sanders, but on the on the right instead of the left, you could say. Um, but that, that that trend seems to continue throughout. Um, and yeah, I think um, 
it, 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 I think it does kind of connect together and make sense that this idea of collaboration, of mutual participation. Even Einstein, when he did write on politics, he talked right. about the, the 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 ugliness of greed and, um, right. and competition uh, in a society. And why would you want greed and competition? Why do you want competition? It's a nasty thing. <laughs> right. You know, he did not like it. He liked uh, sort of a pleasant, everyone smiling and colla- and uh, cooperating with each other. Yeah. And that leaned towards that sort of soft socialism. And um, you could you could even you could even argue that because I do think I've met people who I think I think would be better described as NTPs, but they still insist on on the sort of libertarian thing. And it's not because they're young, but they always insist on it, not with joy, but almost with this kind of resignation, this sense of, well, this it, it, it more in the sense of it for them, it has this democratic notion of this is their way of saying everybody's on the same level because the government isn't going to play the role of the aristocrat everybody and so you can almost get you could argue you'd almost get a leaning towards an anarchist kind of view in that direction um mm. but uh i i'm just spinning spinning a thought out there of sort of different ways it could it could possibly manifest because um, exactly. when the collectivism comes almost autocratic it becomes totalitarian right. then it puts off the alpha right right but hang on we haven't had a discussion about oh, right you you've decided this is how it's going to be and now you're pushing this through and you're not allowing discussion and question you're not allowed us to actually talk it through amongst ourselves and so right. it becomes, that's exactly when the alpha gets put off and that's when the more lib, the more sort of social libertarian side starts to come out and this idea right. you know and, and even the idea of and and when you talk to someone like Ron Paul, it's less about the idea of sharing, but he's or, or less about the idea of uh, of his of his autonomy, but more to do with the idea of someone actually taking things from him that he didn't actually consent to, and not being part right. of the discussion, and not being people being brought on board. Whereas right. For, for a gamma, it's more no no this stuff. This is my business, not your not your business. Stay out of my business. Ah. Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for for revalidating my original ideas on the subject. No, <laughs> but that's, um, why, that's why I found it so compelling from you in the yeah. first place. Because there's a point you. This is why I'm reiterating. You, you, your your ideas around this were very important for influencing me in thinking about the quadras in the way which thematically made sense. Yeah. And then it was a question of, okay, now that I've got this clear theme, how do I make sense of the rest of it? And that's what led me to start thinking about asking, declaring. Right. Other sort which, of reigning dichotomies, which are so, um, which for a long, large amount of time had eluded my grasp. Right. I do, I do like that asking, declaring mm. um, as, as I've, because I've, I've kept that spreadsheet and kind of tried mm. to, to figure out how would I, and I think I, I gave um uh i think i had stuck with the contextual universal thing just to sort of show the bridge in the one seven dichotomies video i made but the the asking declaring would be a nice way of um encapsulating better at least encapsulating the ntp and the sfj together because it's that notion of we want to ask questions we want to be able to discuss oh um, oh, oh i think i think you I think oh. what I said isn't because when you talk about the spreadsheet, I thought, hang on a second, that's quite quite the asking declaring is a completely different family. Oh, like this. never mind. I got uh, confused. Uh, okay, okay. I got confused. This, this is so so it's always more complex than one thinks it is. So this is something which I'm actually going to be going into in my course. My course, I go through all the different dichotomies. So already oh, okay. in like our fifth week, I've already discussed all the information dichotomies, those seven ones we talked mm-hmm. about. As well as the seven function dichotomies for leading, creative role, you know, the, the, the actual slots in the model. The there are then fifteen type dichotomies. Ah, right. Ah, okay. And out of these, because the first four are called the Jungian dichotomies, you, you and I both know the Jungian dichotomies. Right. Um, the other, the question is, what are the other um, twelve, thirteen? 13. 
I think, no, no, am I, is that right? No, no, hang 11, on. sorry. Sorry, be... 11, 11, sorry. 11, the, other yeah. le the other 11, there we go. <laughs> the other 11. Diagnosis. Cut this part, cut yeah. this part. We can't show we're bad at math. <laughs> Yep, no, it's true. Can't, can't even do math. I'm trying to figure out sociology. My goodness. Yep, the other 11 dichotomies are called the Raynin dichotomies. Okay. So, Michael Grigory Raynin, he came up with them. And right, I've heard about that in my in my perusing around a little bit on socionics. Yes. Um, and it's a total mess. Oh, okay. I got mess. that impression. <laughs> yes. And, and, but because some of the de some of the definitions that were given contradict the parts that come before so you had schools of people in russia and ukraine who relied on type of people using rain dichotomies coming to completely different opinions uh-huh was what they were using contradicted model a which was meant to be based on right so my philosophy for the first goodness like um for, for the first like i don't know nine years or so has basically been to draw a line through the Raynan dichotomies and say, right, whichever, if I can't work it out from Model A, it is not useful. I should leave it alone and not use it in typing and tell people not to use them. Mm -hmm. And my where I drew that line has shifted significantly since grappling with your ideas. Mm. That's what that's un, un, allowed me to explore the more far off, weird, distant uh, ideas one of those being asking and declaring it's like one of the last ones to be mentioned it's one of those which is very weird because it's okay i'll tell all the types which share in asking you can see how how different they are right the ntps are asking the nfjs are asking the oh SMPs okay asking, and the and the stjs are asking right so what could possibly unite the SFPs, the NTPs, the NFJs, and the STJs? Right. I'm running through. I'm trying, I'm trying to see whether, I'm trying to remember if there's any. It almost sounds like the only thing that unites them is that they're the only ones that are left when you've gone through all of the other, all of the other connections that you do, right? It's, it's like, well, these are the ones left, so I guess they must. There must be something. Must um, be something. <laughs> inter okay, because uh, I know that we, um, when I was working it out, you there was the, because you have the types where they have introverted perception and extroverted judgment versus the types that have the extroverted perception, introverted yeah. judgment, right? So you have things like that <laughs> that know. unite weird ones, but. This is one that I don't know if we talked about or if we did that. I, okay. Standard dynamics, like one of the first ones he comes out with. You could you could see it as almost being like the fifth Jungian dichotomy when Jung never actually came up with it. It's that, it's that close okay. compared to JP and I, I, IE. It belongs with IE and JP. Okay. Static. It basically is static dynamic. Um, okay. You do the JP switch idea. Um, but... Um, yeah, when it comes to asking and declaring, that's right on the other end of complexity. You can't tie it down to a single, oh, this element in this slot leads to this. Right. Really difficult. It's what's called a superpositional dichotomy. It's not positional. It's not like, for instance, um, what are called merry types, right? Merry types were all those types which valued extroverted ethics and introverted logic. Right, right, simple, straightforward. Right, that is positional. Superpositional is where literally two types next to each other, they won't have it. They won't be the same, but the one after that is the same as the one before. So that's why it gets. Right. It's almost like a sine wave. Like, yeah, the one next to it is actually the opposite, and the one on the other side is the same. Right, right, yeah. and that's that would be why because I suddenly realized what what's going on here is that you're splitting the ntps away from the sfjs and you're they are moving in different categories even though they're both in the same quadra and but, so you but also that an ntp in this particular area shares something in common with an sfp but not with an nfp or with an stp okay okay yeah because because that's the thing ntps are asking 
SFPs are asking, whereas NFPs and STPs are declaring. Right. So what about SFJs then? They are declaring as well. Oh, oh okay. Okay. And, and also NTJs are also declaring. Right. Right. Because of, yeah. Yeah. So it'd be NFJs, NFJs, NTPs, SFPs, and STJs would be the asking. Yes. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. splitting the, splitting, splitting the, the quadras along those, yes, those lines and get, ah, which, and that is why you, you brought that up in connection with, um, uh, my concern about the apparent difference between NTPs and SFJs almost seeming yeah. it's like, okay, this helps to explain. Yes. This is, this is, this is the split. Right. I'm not explaining it well, but I get what you're saying. You're, huh? get, you're getting the the vague gestalt of something in the direction <laughs> which this conversation about to go. So the the idea is well, well initially I say what do people used to use to determine terms someone's asking declare? Because there, there's a whole schools of, of socialists in Russia where they try to type people purely by looking at whether they're asking declaring and also process result, which is another even more complicated ray and dichotomy. And I think maybe static dynamic or number one. All the really annoying right at the end ones. It's not static dynamic. I think it must have been aristocratic, democratic. And the annoying ones at the end, right? So like, there's no way of actually knowing because it's at all connected to Model A anymore. It's basically right. its own system because the methodology is disconnected. And so they used to say, well, askers, they, they ask more questions. And declarers, they declare things more. And like... <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, so... No, well, I, I mean that at least that could supposedly be be empirically tested, though I don't know if it's going to tell yes. you anything about the personality per se. Yeah. <laughs> See how yeah. many statements end in a question mark in terms of how they phrase them. But exactly. Uh, and there's these whole people who mark in the tally how many times someone asked a oh, question. Oh, really? You that, that that kind of approach is very oh. common into the in, in Russian sorts of schools. They like marking things in tallies. Right. And, and it doesn't. I, I, I don't think it actually works right. because if people vary in contexts. But the so I drew, I drew a line in the sand. I wasn't going to include any of that stuff until I'd made sense of it properly. Right. So here's how I've started to make sense of it properly. Right. You you as you've noticed, NTPs don't quite gel with the collectivism idea, especially when they're younger. Right. Right. Also, we go to gammas. Right. The NTJ is very clear. They're fiercely individualistic. They don't like being included in other people's business, other people getting into their business. The SFPs, on the other hand, mm -hmm. it's not so clear cut. They often have quite strong friendships. They're often quite chummy with people. Mm -hmm. They are still close bonds of loyalty with others. Particularly you know? ESFPs, kind of like the ESFJs from before. Yeah. yeah. But there's something weird about an ESFP. When you talk to them, they often I've spoken to an ESFP and they say, oh, I think I'm an introvert. <laughs> uh, spoke to them, okay, for, partly that's because they just can't really put themselves in the box of talks. They don't have the ability to actually form overall yeah. uh, judgments in terms of what they are like categorically. They're just really bad at doing it. It's not natural for them. But also, they do have a sort of internal independent streak, despite yes. the external socializing. Yes, very the much so. The idea is, over time, they become more fiercely dependent as they grow. They grow from being someone who basically who starts to base their opinions on their or their friends think around them, being very much like that, to being someone who won't be told what what what, what to think and very much about no, this is what I think. This is uh, I am competent enough myself. I am independently capable and all the rest. Um, yeah. Can can I add in an anecdote? Oh, to, no, to, I I have a I have a rather good. I've well I've actually known a number of ESFPs in my life, but I have a right now I in particular I have an ESFP friend who I feel like has been making the very transition you're talking about because you know is has has sort of nascent in them or not even really nascent but unconscious or deep in them this fundamental independence that is because of the gamma quadra yeah. and yet tends to not 
has struggled with setting up boundaries with other people and is too flowy with people. And so in that sense, becomes very gregarious and um, and also, you know, seems almost ESFJ ish, even though they they're not. She is not. Um, and uh, but has due to certain experiences, has recently been having to learn and has almost consciously been um, uh, sort of instilling the way that the way that she is understanding it, because as we've been talking, this is kind of how I was framing it, is she understands it as putting down T.I. boundaries. I'm like, you know, she's like, teach me how to T.I. And I'm like, I'll do my best. <laughs> But in order to set up these boundaries uh, with people of like, I will not No, I know the opportunity looks great, but I will not cross this line because I'm trying to maintain my sanity. Like, but, but what's interesting is that the effect of this seems to be, I'm sure over a long period of time, what will eventually happen is exactly what you're saying, where they become more independent and ultimately take on more traits that are alt NTJ ish in mm -hmm. hopefully a positive way that they assert, here's what I need, and I will negotiate with my environment. And it, it I don't know if that makes sense, I, uh, but. I mean, there's, there's, for, for instance, I would expect an ESFP to start off with to be good at getting what they want from a conversation. Right. And, and good at, first of all, knowing what they want, at least in the short term, and being able to build relationships to serve them right. to get what they want. Um, I think in terms of bound, when, when when we talk about boundary formation, it may, may also mean different things. If you, if you view the idea of TI boundary formation, having distinction and clarity in yes. terms of what is actually going to go against a principle or not. And I don't think ESFPs do that very well. I think they're very much pragmatic, opportunistic. Yes. And so things just blend into everything else. Yes. Um, but I think ESFPs are good at boundary forming in terms of if I don't like that person, they're not going anywhere near me. I'm not going to let them. Uh, right. So more, the sort of social, uh, psychological distance boundary creation, I think the Gamma SFs are masters at. I think that's right. kind of what they do very well, but they lean towards doing that to sort of protect their friends more. And then it right. starts to be more about actually, I this is my path, this is what I want to achieve and where I want to go and how do I exercise my competence in the long run. Yes. And I think ultimately that is what she will actually end up needing to do or will end up doing even if she calls it TI, because that is what that is what is most natural is is more that kind of motivation for the boundary forming, because it's it's probably not going because for me, I just get a kick even out of imagining. And maybe it's because it's for me, it's tertiary. So I just I just love it in principle, even if I don't always follow it. But um, <laughs> Just a kick out of, oh, this is my this is my line in the sand. If anything crosses this line in the sand, I will destroy it. <laughs> like I get this kick out of that idea. And so it's uh, out of that idea in itself, which ESFPs do not get that same kick. They're like, but but what if it's what if it's a candy bar that comes across? Like, what about this? What about this? Like, like I want to be flowy. And I'm like, but there's don't you get that satisfaction out of making a nice clean slice through the thing that is crossing over they're like no i don't understand what you're talking about right but i, I yeah. don't know if that makes sense but no but there's some of that say i as well some of that is yeah saying the saying no to possibilities yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but also ti to help inform which possibilities say no to based on an, an ideology or a principle yes that bit, I don't think they grasp. They grasp the idea of actually having a developed sense of purpose for which they say no to things which aren't on purpose. Right. But the principal side, I think they will disagree with because they well, it depends on the situation. For them, everything right. depends on the situation. Everything is so rooted in context for an ESFP. Right. That's um, why they're relying more on the extroverted logic, mm -hmm. the extroverted thinking, the, yes. um, the facts as they are coming in rather than, in some sense, the the fact principle that i have posited to organize myself in relation to it i was uh, once interviewing an, e an esfp an, an, an sce uh yeah. in socionics um type interview um he at one point was a police officer and mm -hmm. he recounted to me a situation he found especially frustrating where he had just in a situation managed to solve a problem relevant to the police 
He did it very well. He excelled in that. And no one had ever seen someone do that before. And it was a brilliant. But suddenly, these officials started coming to him saying, right, you need to now do a paper on this so we can standardize this across for everyone else to follow. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh-huh. Uh, which, which, to be fair, almost makes me cringe too, but I'm sure it was incredibly frustrating for, for him. Um, though, to be fair, also... If I were in the actual city, I probably still would be able to do that. I may, I may have reservations about it because I know the contextual side, but I could probably figure out how to BS something out. But anyway, continue your story. I'm just well, running it through. That's the point. I think it's like oh, okay. you yeah. can't be you can't be competent based on rules. You need to have knowledge. You need to have initiative. And you need to be able to look at the situation and act in the most effective way according to that situation. Yes. And you can't expect that the situation you are in is actually going to be repeated again. Yes. Yes, so exactly. Did not compute with him that exactly that rules that you do this because that situation might not happen again. Why would we have a rule on it? You right. Got to use the ever elusive common sense. Yes. You have to use your into Aristotelian virtue ethics. Really, I mean, yeah. it's a very, it's a very that gamma, mm -hmm. it, as far as I'm concerned, gamma kind of system. Yeah, and I agree. I agree with Aristotle being, but he yeah. Had just said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the other thing I was thinking of is that is why you will get this naturally, whether you like it or not, you will get an aristocratic kind of mindset because you want the right kind of people who have the right kind of sense and the right kind of virtues to react correctly in the different situations um, because you can't standardize it as a rule. And so you get more of a, um, yeah, I, I, which I just find fascinating how that which, naturally arises. Which also makes me always, I get like a sort of internal grating when <laughs> When I hear, when I hear, um, there are a number of sort of um, type coaches, you know, practitioners, professionals. And they like to talk about Kiersey temperaments. They love Kiersey temperaments. Uh, and they like to talk about the NTs. And the NTs, above all, like competence. Mm. Thinking, yes. Oh, no, no, sure. Some NTs are all about <laughs> competence. But other NTs, maybe not so much. It's not made the main thing. Because just as you said, that basically is competence. The reading mm -hmm. of competence in someone is if you were to take away the rule book, they'd be able to think and work out what to do, use their own minds to figure out how best to solve a situation. It's competence already suggests extroverted logic as being yes. virtue, not so yes. much introverted logic. There is a contextuality to it. Mm -hmm. That That's sort of what I mean by contextuality is, mm -hmm. it depends on the context, but anyway, yeah, you. And, and to some degree I've realized, but in Myers-Briggs, True INTPs and true ESFPs don't actually exist. <laughs> oh, they, okay. They haven't been, they can't explain an INTP properly or an ESFP properly because right. they are, because they think that INTPs are going to be like the other NTs and being quite harsh and quite sort of fiercely independent. I mean, right. INTPs get away with it because they've got enough extroverted thinking in their demonstrator functions in the background. Right. Well, and as an ENTP, they'll probably they could could talk about competence a bit more. Right. But an INTP it really does not work that way, and they're so soft and they're so conflict averse, they probably end up as a feeler. And I've right I've doing now. I started doing um, I started doing um, team development sessions, and I've noticed that when we talk about feeling versus thinking, the I the INTP in the room, I know because I've talked to them beforehand. Starts like thinking, oh, I'm not sure about the way they're describing feeling and thinking here. I actually, I think I sound a bit more like a feeler based on this definition, even though we know he's a thinker, mm -hmm. because it's not actually the way they describe it as being almost sort of warm hearted versus tough minded does not work for the INTP. Yeah. And in another session, we see the same thing. And I, and I remember saying to um, you know, the, the guy I work with, I don't think the ESFP is going to like that description. And I was bang on the money. They don't mm -hmm. like it either. They, they think because they actually are quite tough minded and they mm -hmm. don't like the sort of more conflict averse description of the feeler. Um, and is, who actually demands competence and frequently see ESFPs testing as ESTJs. Ah, yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, actually, my one ESF who is is brilliant, by the way, my one ESFP friend, um, in 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 very ESFP way, but uh, has I felt I felt very nice because she she was like, your videos are the only I hear this a lot. Your videos are the only videos that have described it right, and I know it's because I I tried my very best not to fall into the usual stereotypes that you get with just the straight MBTI, mm. just the you know, the four dichotomies, it, it, it works, I suppose, for empirical trying to create the indicator, but you run into these problems, like you said, where, um, you, you know, it, it just misses so much richness that, um, is involved. That's a very interesting observation though. E ESFPs being typed as ESTJs. Yes. Or, or sometimes just ESTP, which is the most common, right? Like We've done that. We actually compare. There's like an experiment which had people look, socialists look at descriptions of the ESTP and ESFP and all the rest. They loaded ESFP as being more like SEE was more like ESTP than ESFP because all the cuddliness right was kept in ESFP and it's just not in, in socialics. The ES, yeah. the ES is quite a tough figure because they, they, they can't put through their heads that you can be a very social socially oriented person and actually be a tough nut yes and that's why we get julius caesar being an entj when he's actually an esfp you get um i don't know other like plenty of other examples people i don't think many people type mark cuban in america as an esfp even though he would be an see in socionics right that kind of kind of thing and the more they develop the more clear this becomes because the more they reach into extroverted thinking rather than extroverted feeling right. uh, the more this becomes a thing um but yeah that was that's alpha and gamma but also yeah. beta and delta, we see a similar sort of thing going on yes so when it comes to beta we think they're the most sort of external quadrant they're the world changing ones they're the ones right. this is the program get with the program um and yeah, that's natural for the STs in beta to do that because they're far more action oriented. They're far more impact right. and and status driven, you could also say. Whereas the NFJs, they got this very deep spiritual wandering side to them, you know, and they, they're quite philosophical. This idea of no, we're going to get with a program isn't quite clear right. or obvious with them. Sometimes NFJs don't immediately say oh, they are the world changers. And I think they, again, they are the asking types in beta. Right. They're the ones who are growing towards being more externally influential. Now, are the, would you say that um, it works the other way too, where the declaring types move more to more towards being like, oh no, okay, it's no. only the one, the one way. But it, and, and and how do I describe to explain the declaring then? What does declaring need from our from the asking types then if they're not the ones who actually ah, need? It's like this. Right. The declaring type has made its way to the promised land. <laughs> the promised yeah, land. yeah, yeah, yeah. But they realize on this on this great journey, they've made their way to the promised land. It's desert it's not sustainable they can't actually remain in the promised land for very long it's all going to fall apart they need the asking type to come to join them in the promised land to make it sustainable to make it a, an oasis rather than a desert the and it, it, you, you could sort of reach into hegel here the idea of thesis antithesis synthesis right Oh, that's interesting. And that that would almost lead into the into the notions of the dual relations um, yeah. and and the importance of, of that. Uh, oh, interesting. I, if you think about it in terms of alpha, right, you just get SFJs. Right. They get very sort of, you know, the stereotype of SFJs where no yes, one yes, questions, yes. everyone wants to fit in. It's very conformist. Yes. You know, there's no, it's just kind of boring and off-putting if you just think of it that way. It comes almost stagnant. Right. But the SFJs, they know it's stagnant. It's not as if they're blind to that, but they don't quite know how things should be questioned. Right. It's not that they're ignorant to this. Um, no. They know they've gotten to where they feel they need to go, but they still feel something is missing. And what is missing has to be provided by either another person or at the very least an injection of 
that person's personality traits into the mix in some in some ah interesting and is that is that why um i remember you mentioning and i've i've always struggled to understand it the static versus dynamic is that at all related to that or is that a completely different thing because i was thinking in my head of like oh one is static and then the other is dynamic moving towards it but i don't uh, know if that's just, i uh, okay i see what you mean it's interesting well it, that will change so for instance in the betas and the deltas the static one is a declarer okay in, in, in alphas and gammas the static one is the asker Okay. Now, there could be a reason for why that is. I haven't yet formulated that reason. Well, but we could think about that for a second. Why would that be? I no, I think I had thought that and I've forgotten about it because I hadn't really reached a conclusion about it. But essentially, at what alphas and gammas have in common, this is what we were talking about before, was this idea in like a previous... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did want to talk about that, the yes, things they I, have in common and that betas and, and uh, deltas have in common. But, yes. And I think it's that, that what I call identifying versus transforming. That the alphas and gammas are both on that on that axis right. of deciding where are we, are we in relation to society. And the betas and the, the deltas are instead deciding what the locus of change is going to be. Ah. And... In a way, that suggests to me that, okay, so the idea of figuring out where we are in relation to society, that, that there's a kind of, um, that means it's, it's we are moving ourselves in a to, to a certain ideal spot. Uh, and so in a way, the ones who are declaring are about going towards that ideal spot. Whereas the ones who are asking need to now sort of, I know, put in the staticness, whatever that staticness is, to make it sustainable. The when it comes to the betas and deltas, it's more no, we're already in our spot. This is um, this is um, where the locus of change needs to be. But how do we then create and make that change workable? And that's more of a dynamic side, perhaps. Right. So, I think I think so. I think what one, the alphas and gammas, the identifiers, right, rather than the transformers, they are looking for that that's something to crystallize them in their place. Now that they've moved to that place, that's the static side, and the transformers, they are looking for some sort of dynamo to enact the change which they've said it needs to be here. What is the dynamo going to be? What is the right. thing that's going to make that thing? um transformative rather than merely just acting without direction or learning um or exploring oneself without, without any sort of matter to to accumulate skills and capabilities when it comes to delta um that's kind of my attempt to figure it out i'm not this is me this is you know this is really in spitball territory no you're um, you're you're good i'd need to sit down and and work it out almost geometrically to make sure i'm keeping everything straight but um i really i i had forgotten about the identifying transforming which ah, my my right. my brain immediately is like going ah i'm like creating a table which mm. is not how it was originally intended where i'm like oh static dynamic uh the the, I can't even remember the name of the other one. I can see the image in my mind. I'm like imagining the thing moving towards the other thing um, within the quadras. And then you could almost argue that you have uh, a movement between the quadras where the transformative ones are moving towards the identifying ones in one direction or the other, which would be interesting if it's, that it's were the case. It's a bit like Dante's Inferno, where you're descending into hell, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, you know how the way it worked was that they descend into hell, and they reached a point they get a bit stuck, and they needed that giant, as it were, to carry them oh. through, through the gates of dis. Right. right? And suddenly you get to the real crazy sins. <laughs> you, know, you know, gluttony, lust, they got nothing on these later sins. Right, right. Like um, blasphemy know, like, treachery, and treachery, 
on the edge. Uh, yes, exactly. Blasphemy. You know, those really complicated ones, which aren't yeah. sort of base appetites, but like complicated psychological right. ones. So in the similar sort of way, what are the gates of dis in this example? <laughs> the gates of dis are, is identifying transforming. Ah. That's, that, that is the Ren dichotomy, which from interacting with your ideas enabled me to solve. And then I went to ask and declare and to then try to figure out the next part, the next step. You need identifying transforming first to be pinned down before you can get to asking and declaring for that to make sense. Right. So it was about the idea is identifying types, the alphas and the gammas, what they share in common. They're both arguing in the same space, which is where do we position ourselves relative to, to the rest of society, whether we want to right. evolve ourselves as a society or be apart from society. Right. And then the betas and deltas, it's not about placement. It's more about where change, where are they going to enact change, whether it is change within oneself, internal, or it's external world change. Right. Right. A comment, a comment on that, which is not completely related, but I wanted to mention it, um, is in my, and I might, uh, in my thinking about the betas and deltas, and it works nicely with, because I believe we had talked about before, the notion of the deltas, that internal feeling to it, which is almost, uh, I think we might have called it integrity seeking or something, yeah. something like, yeah. Whereas with the, um, with the betas, the thing that I remember noticing um, that it tipped me off to this was, and I, there are hints of it in Motes and Beams, though I don't think I really fully grasped it except by accident, is the connection of FE and SE and how, which, you know, obviously follows from, from some of the things that you've been saying and that I hadn't, but specifically with FE and SE and thinking about that and realizing SE has a similar, um, the word that I've latched onto, even though I don't think it, I'm properly using it is mimetic. Um, but I'll explain what specifically I mean. I have this notion of there is this, uh, uh, in my conception of Effie and Essie, there is this adaptableness, but more specifically, it's like a, both, both functions are aware of their, the persona that they are giving to people. Um, there is a, there is a persona focus rather than an integrity focus. And, and there, that's why you kind of have almost the shape-shifting adaptability. And it's not just an FE thing mm. of presenting yourself in a way in order to interact with the feeling space. Yes. You get it with extroverted sensation as well, which is expressed in the element of showmanship or of, of adaptability mm. to situations. And I had never thought about that before, but it all of a sudden made it click that both you could describe this is why I'm kind of pulling into a different area here, but you can describe both the NFJs and the STPs on that same wavelength of this mimetic or persona focused quality, because with the ISTP is a bit odd in that regard, but definitely with the ESTP, I think you get that. And certainly with the NFJs, um, and I've seen it in myself, um, whereas, and it helps to explain why with the Delta types, you you almost have this aversion to that to the point that it drives me nuts because it's like they are out of tune with what everybody else is doing and um and seem to celebrate that fact and it's like this you no this is not you need the taste to match what your audience is looking for you don't impose your taste onto your audience and then of course the audience loves it when people do that sometimes and I'm like, well, the audience is crazy, but, um, and it, it's, I don't know if that made sense. I kind of went off. No, but you, you've, you've sort of, you've moved into another set of ideas I've been formulating for my course. Yeah. By the right? way, before, what is your course? Oh, well, okay. Okay. Let me talk. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I'm, no. I'm this is why I don't think you've been, you haven't put up videos for a little while. No. So I, I've yeah. been, I've been work beavering away at a, a course to introduce socionics in as full as I can and extent to someone completely starting out afresh. Right. And I've been piloting that. 
Okay. So I'm in the fifth week of piloting it with with a group of people who are, who are paid uh, a reduced price to experience it in its fresh organic right. stage, still making up exactly how much time I give to each section as we go along in each week. Uh -huh. But it started off as a project I thought it would take 12 weeks to do. It's now going to be a, probably a 16 week course. Well, that's apt. Um, yeah. <laughs> that seems fitting. It is nice and apt, but um, it, it just because I'm producing too much content. Yeah. <laughs> and, and each time I do it, it's basically, I say, I got a rule, can't be more than two hours. People right. aren't going to be able to concentrate more than two hours. So it's going to be a 32-hour uh, right. presentation nonstop of content for someone to learn. So that's mm -hmm. a whole university course. Right, right. right. So it's long. Um, it's in-depth. It has videos, it has exercises for people to do, it has all these different things. And at the end of it, people are meant to both understand the theory and be practiced to some degree in right. being able to apply that to type people. And I have an assignment at the end for people to actually apply what they've learned, after which point I can give them, you know, the nice little title of, oh, you are now a WSS Socionist. People like having oh. little certificates saying they are something. It's just, um, yeah. Once you create a certificate, people want to. I know one person who is doing it purely to get the uh, the certificate. Oh, really? Okay. Because it just has people like that. The the the, the, the illusion of legitimacy is one. <laughs> um, so you're being very open about that. <laughs> That's what anybody does, right? This is what you know in the in the UK, the British Psychological Society does. They've set themselves up as the body to prescribe uh, a qualification to say right. you the credit courses which exist and because they've accredited it suddenly it's all the more official than if they hadn't accredited it right it, it, it's and and any and any you need a starting point somewhere someone has to do it otherwise it's never is done right. so me being doing it, it's probably better than someone else doing it because right <laughs> i'm, I'm a, most people will say i know what i'm talking about in this particular field so it it it, it does but but as the person who's created it i know <laughs> All the lacking of perfection in that idea, you know. I, I'm behind, you know. I'm I'm behind the the green floating head in the, in the Wizard of Oz, you know. I'm, I'm a little guy behind the curtain, but um, you know, I I know it's all that that is the bit of showmanship you could say, but okay. but the um, yeah, it's uh, people are taking people are enjoying it so far. People are getting good feedback from it, and eventually I will either do a thing where I each year. I do the course in person. So people can ask questions, uh, and also I'm gonna I'm recording things. So I might do a cheaper version. We just want to watch the recording. Have time to attend things in person. Fine, you can watch recordings and just do your assignment and send that to me later, and I'll mark it and all the rest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just want to generate more um, highly high functioning socionists. And that, that's my way of doing it. And you're making... increasing literacy in the in the domain. Yes, yeah. that's the idea. Uh, but I, the idea is that I'm also injecting all of my new ideas right. into this, which is why it's taking so much longer, right. as well as finding video clips of everything takes much longer. Um, yeah, but, but one of the ideas which you right. lent into, right, it, and it's one of these new small groups which I came up with. So you know the old school, the clubs and quadras and temperaments, right? Everyone likes these small groups. Yes. A new small group I came up with was called tournaments. Tournaments. Yes. All right. And that and that and, and that in and tournaments, the idea is it's not again. It's this idea that what they have in common is what they're fighting over. Ah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering for a moment if you're using a more abstruse definition or if it was what I thought it was. So, okay, this I think I know where you're going with this, but keep going. Right. So you 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 brought it up about deltas and betas around showing. Yeah. Right. And it's not as the thing is it's not as sharp in all the betas and all the deltas. It's particularly sharp between the beta energizers or extroverts. And the delta introverts are integrators. Right. Hence They're the, the, most... the conflict types in socionic center type relations. Yes. Conflict and also extinguishment. Right. Yes. And this idea that if you take 
these two types across the different quads, you get basically four tournaments. And the tournament of this one is the tournament of authenticity. Oh, okay. Between between the betas and the deltas? Specifically ENFJ and ESTP and INFP oh, wow. and, and ISTJ. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Now, now elaborate on authenticity because that's very right. interesting. Exactly. <laughs> What is all? Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Because I, oh well, that that puts a very interesting, that puts a very interesting flavor on how self, uh, how, oh, see, because what's interesting is I'm always quite open about the notion of referring to the persona-driven nature as as this um, uh, mimetic sort of shape-shifting quality i'm always very focused on uh i'm willing to admit that there is there is a falsity there i just i'm just endlessly entertained now by by the flipping back and forth between infj and infp i don't know why that entertains me so much of seeing yeah. like you know what what am i i i mean i i consider myself infj but I the reason so. i'm mentioning that is because i feel like um uh oh, that's that's interesting because 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 although i tend to emphasize in my attempt to own up to uh problems that i perceive i have i don't think other infjs do that as much because they don't perceive yeah. themselves as because because normally the argument i would make is that well i am authentic but authentic doesn't mean that you just blurt out whatever you're thinking at any moment to anybody. You have to essentially apply yourself to different people and be authentic with different people. Sorry, I'm just like buzzing away on this. That's interesting. But, 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 okay. One thing is, Sorry. yes. Some, one of the reasons why I wondered if you might be INFP is that you right. seemed, at least from talking to you earlier on, to be on a very clear side in the authenticity tournament. Yes, <laughs> but, um, but actually, I think no. I don't think that's your. I, I don't think that is actually the tournament you are fighting. But okay, but that also goes to to show for me why you know if you are you know as you are a beta, why actually the beta introverts aren't really in that tournament on the other side. Um, whereas the ENFJs and ESTPs, yes, they are in the showmanship side of the audience. Oh, okay. Um, so let, let me let me go into what, yeah. what I mean by this. Okay, first of all, another thing I'd say: there's another, yet another reign of dichotomy called positivist and negativist. All right. Um, and I'd try to think what the hell does that mean? Positivist and negativist, and people say, oh, it's optimists and and pessimists. Not really, but it's it. I realize depending on whether you're positivist or negativist, you'll be taking a more affirming or denying aspect or attitude towards the thing being debated in the tournament right. so authenticity so what is the affirmative view of authenticity be yourself right be true to who you are what you're about right you are and who are you do what's sincere do what feels right in each moment right you know if you're talking to someone say you know d d d cut the crap just say, say say how you feel about it it's okay if you're a bit blunt because that that's true and that's real to you. It's okay if you you know you're not you're not you're not putting on any kind of show. Okay if it's boring. Okay if it's sort of messy and complicated. Sure, but that's your humanity showing through. Right. That's that's all the mess of humanity, and that's absolutely fine. Just be yourself. Don't let anyone else convince you how to be any any way. Just be who you are. You are just a person. You are that person. That's it. The, the more denying aspect towards authenticity is saying, no, no, authenticity, to be an authentic person, involves having an image that is recognized by other people around you. So you need to construct you know, who, who you are, and that sense doesn't actually matter. You need to actually matter in the world. You need to become an image greater than this. You need to clarify yourself to existence. Right. And so the people... Which would be the ENFJs, ESTPs would be more in that realm. Right. We're talking about the David Bowies, the right. Freddie Mercury's, the Madonnas. 
right. the people who can invent themselves and reinvent themselves to become right. this image that that is greater than any particular homespun individual and that is their authenticity that their authentic self-expression um is for them that is their authenticity right um so it's, it's a packaged self which they've put through and that is more real than than, than the people around them it, it it will continue beyond even when they're gone that is the the image the alexander the great as well or the right. uh, the um you know the, the pompey the great or right people tend to have the great on the end of their name they become timeless napoleon another one um yeah. th these beta extroverts there and it's, it's a completely different understanding it's a more negativist understanding of authenticity it's not affirming in of themselves it's not going to create something other than just here and that that gestalt or balloon i've created of me that is the true me right um so yeah that is the kind of the debate going on in the authenticity tournament and that's why infps and icjs are the least likely to do anything like that um, and they're often misconstrued when they do become celebrities in terms of what they're trying to do right and they're seen as though they're like enfjs and ESTPs doing the wrong sort of thing Taylor Swift is a good example of this. She she doesn't her whole um, reputation album is basically about being misconstrued as a, right. as, a as a beta doing it wrong. Right. <laughs> she's just trying to explore her relationship. She's not right. trying to do people down in the public eye. She just she's doing her usual confessional diary. Here is me and my relationship right. and all its messiness because that is right. you know interesting interesting right so so the tournament is authenticity and then the negativistic uh approach is the beta types and the positivistic is the and that's just sort of the way of describing now for the for the alpha and gamma mm. which one's positivistic and which one would be negativistic well again it depends they, they swap, swap around so there are two different oh. tournaments which involve alpha and gamma Oh, okay. So I only pick two from each. So the other two is the other way around. So, so have, oh, so, okay. So, cause that's what I thought you had been saying yeah. earlier. Not, so, not all beaters are negativists. Only okay. Beaters okay. Beaters. I thought for a moment, that's what you were saying. And for a moment no. I was like, oh, that's not as interesting as I thought it was, but no. it is as interesting. So, so the ENFJ and ESTP in the beta side would be the, would be the negativistic. Yes. In, okay. Whereas, oh, okay. Whereas the INFJ and ISTP would be positivistic, yes. Um, even though they are beta, so the beta has got nothing to do with being positivist and negativistic. Every quadra has two negativists and two positivists. Oh, okay. Right. And then that would that would link up the INFJ and ISTP with the um, ENFP and ESTJ. Yep. Okay. Interesting. So they're having a different tournament. They're, they're tournament having a different tournament. About authenticity. It's about truth. Ah. Right. It's not. It's okay. I see. So the authenticity name for the tournament that only applies to the two from the one and the two from the other. I see. Yes, Whereas the other. Oh, okay. So there and would end up being a total of a no, no, four, four tournaments. Okay. Yeah, yeah total. Okay. Okay. And the and tournament yeah. on truth. I interesting. Um, so the positivist way of doing this is there is an absolute truth. Right. There is something uh, of clarity, which we can get behind. This is uh -huh. it. This is the ideal. This is the, the almost the ideology. Um, and it, the most hardline ideologues tend to be the INFJs and ISTPs. Um, meanwhile, the negativists are the ones who almost like, well, it depends on the situation. <laughs> <laughs> and it's See, like, which is interesting because normally I think people have the false impression that ESTJs are, are, and maybe even ESTJs think that they are, there is, there is an absolute objective truth. Ah that 
But I don't know how you would reply to that because I think it's more complicated than that. But that's because a lot of LSIs or ISDPs end up testing as ESTJs. Ah, right. So you get you have a lot of ESFPs who are typed as ESTJs, whereas the actual I, er, ESTJs. ESTJs are sort of a mix in, in the, yeah. the, 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 the sort of stereotypical ESTJ, not the actual ESTJ, sort of a mix of various yeah. types of sensation oriented types. Usually um, LSIs on one hand or SCEs on the other hand. But the particularly, right. you know, unmoving, almost sort of rigid sort are usually LSIs. Or right. the, the, the ones who are a bit more like the Putins or the Stalins or the Hillary Clintons. Right. Yeah. That that kind of yeah. Or the Malcolm X's. Okay. Um, yeah. So that that is that I'd say that she would be a beta. Deltas are not the actual ESTJ, a Delta ESTJ is more like George H. W. Bush. Ah, he's not very hard line. He was sort of kind of soft, kind of pragmatic. I mean, he was capable of being tough because they are capable. Of they got extra sensation in the demonstrative function, but they grow towards being more open. Right. And, and people treat almost uniquely that people treat the the ES ESJs as if they don't have a tertiary function. Right. Yes. They're just, they're, yes. Saying, they're just like more obnoxious versions of the ISJs. Right. But they're not. They have no. more ME. They actually don't have that rigidity. They actually yes. are meant to be opening up. They actually some of the more open types. The problem with these types is actually that they're almost too open. They don't yeah. know what possibilities have weight. Right. Which oh, that's so delicious because because as an N, as an ni type and by the way your description of the of the sort of infj istp view of like there is there is the truth the positivistic there is the truth and i'm just smiling because i'm like okay yeah no, i'm infj <laughs> so i'm just like that is that is exactly like i don't express it because of no. the current but like that is my guiding no I, I'd, I'd have to maybe if, if, explain a little more in detail but anyway um mm -hmm. Ah, shoot. What was I saying? Um, the, uh, uh, what was I saying before, before I went off on that? You and, were talking about it, about ESTJs and we talk about, it's interesting as an NI type, you know, I was talking yes, about. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, I love that. I love, because I have noticed as I've actually paid closer attention and I love that description you gave that I, I, the sort of, naive version of it is to think oh the esdjs and esfjs their ni is really kind of shut away therefore they are they are sticks in the mud they they are not a, right and you see the irony here they, yeah. it, they're perceived as not being open to possibilities and stuff when really what's actually happening is it's just they're not open to the ni types one possibility that they are presenting as the truth because they are genuinely more open to possibilities and that's what's actually going on they're just not weighting the ni types possibility as the most important and so oh that's wonderful because i've definitely seen that ne it particularly in ES, esfjs like yeah. like my younger sister like you and especially as like you said like the, as they get older and they get more in touch with that oh that's sorry i'm just i'm tickled yeah. pink by that that's that's brilliant they, they want to try that. everything right no idea what will actually happen or what will never happen right they waste and, a lot of time and a lot of energy right hence you you could you could say and i don't know for sure but it almost reminds me of that um uh tesla versus edison um yes. that classic quote where he's like edison would go through like him trying to try out all the filaments for the light bulb or something. Um, yes. uh, that would perhaps be an example of this, assuming Tesla's INTJ and, and uh, Edison is, is I know it, I, I definitely agree with you on, te on Edison. Tesla, again, Tesla? a point of debate. Okay. Around whether he's INTJ or was actually INTP. Okay. It was, it was so naive. 
in terms of right. He was really not. He had introverted intuition, but I think there may have been a demonstrator function. I'm okay, not okay. Really sure. I lean more towards him being an INTP. Okay. I can see that. Jewish. I'm not. I said I'm not like a hundred percent on this, but yeah. he just was so bizarrely naive towards force and pressure, and right with his patents and his ideas. And at the same time, he really wanted to fit in and to be accepted, right. to dress up all, all, all sophisticatedly and try right. to invite people to see his experiments. And, right. and right. You know, there's, there's something about it that doesn't seem very gamberish. It seems almost like quite a naive alpha who's trying to reach towards collectivism, isn't quite getting there. Right. But in any case, Edison, you definitely oh, yeah. see you see that bah, 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 going yes. through every single possibility. No, no zeroing in on that one. Uh, that's I just I'm just delighted by that sort of ironic uh, reversal of the real issue is that the NI type is not open, <laughs> and and uh, and that's the real issue. Um, but okay, anyway, that's that's delightful. Yeah, that's it. It's just all sort of superficial, inane possibilities. That are gonna, yes. and it's so, and it's just frustrating to the intro, to an, to an introvert, intuitive type. Um, and right. the idea they'll, they'll account for every single possible thing, and you can't tell them something is just not going to work. They will, okay. ESFJs with INTJs is that thing. ESFJs will not be told something just won't work. Right. They hate that fatalistic negativity. And they'll basically say you're being pessimistic, you're being a killjoy. We're going to see if we can try it, and then of course it all goes horribly wrong. <laughs> um, or for uh, an ESTJ, they will, they believe if they just work hard enough, they can make almost anything happen. Ah, interesting. If there are any, if there are any risks, they they love controlling for risks. What we'll do is they'll prepare for every single possible risk. Um, right, won't know which risk will actually is more likely to happen versus any other one. They just know what they can experience and they can see and they can test and improve. They're, right. they're trial and error. Right, and hence you get, you know, the the tension between the INFJ and the ESTJ presumably comes from. Excuse me, the INFJ is like I have to put it in exaggerated terms. I've seen the truth. I've seen it. It is here. I can describe it to you. And the ESTJ is like, that is malarkey. I'm yep. going to, I'm going to keep doing. And as particularly, by the way, uh, it's like you twinged a nerve when you said specifically, mm -hmm. if I just keep working hard enough, then, then eventually I can get this to work. And I'm yes. like, you must prison for you because you're going to hurt so many people <laughs> by doing that. You are a psychopath. Yes. I, I'm like, that's how I know there's yeah. some type related thing going on when it's like there is a twinge nerve and I go into moralistic mode. That's, that's fascinating. The ECJ isn't actually saying, no, I'm not open to what you're talking about. Right. It says more, why should I elevate that possibility over all these other possibilities? I need some right. evidence. Right. I need something to see from experience to know that your possibility right. is more important than these others. Because otherwise, I'm going to account for all of them. Right. Um, and the INFJ does not bring factual evidence. They bring a just knowing. And the ESTJ yes. does not bring just knowing. <laughs> uh, Richard Dawkins, I think, is an ESTJ. Oh, reason. really? Okay. He doesn't do the just knowing. He has to yeah. have factually empirical accounts for everything and the ENTJ at least can reach leaps from their analysis of the facts right. ESTJ just can't do the leaps yeah and i definitely at least in the past have i get a i've gotten along much better with entjs than with with estjs now i don't know how many genuine estjs i have um, because uh, it's it's been yeah. tricky for, and I also think that I just don't frequent the circles where you're more likely to find ESTJs because of the just oh. statistically differing in, in, in inferences. But um, or if you do uh, interviews, if you do interviews for an English bank, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I do think. I think I've noticed. Um, from the people who I've suspected at least were probably ESTJ or at the very least ISTJ, 
there can there can be and i believe this is described by socionics to a certain extent there there can often be like a an almost a smoothness of interaction on the surface particularly when handling like business stuff and they are in their element and i am going to them for help or something like and like like at a bank or something i feel like there can be a smoothness there where it's like oh i'm 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 okay with this but when you get to the actual philosophical principles of why should we do this what where should we go going back to where should the change in society come from to go to kind of that transformative thing that's where you definitely run into problems particularly i i think i've noticed it more for me in pedagogical philosophies where where whenever there's something that seems more estj-ish to me or those things i associate with estj i'm just like very cringe which is interesting and i think that that's partly uh, partly your, um, your creation as well because when it comes to infjs right and, and every type has a mixture of stubborn and flexible parts right all right and this is kind of it's, it's on the stubborn parts which you, i've constructed the tournaments for right authenticity, it's fe and se versus fisi for truth it's ti versus te and ni versus any right together. So for an INFJ, they're actually very flexible in the FE department. Right. They are very smooth. They're very diplomatic. You're not going to get into a very overt argument with an INFJ, except maybe online in text, but not in person. Right. Um, but, the, but despite the very diplomatic exchange you may have an INFJ, they're going to be have a far more stubborn logic underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very hard to dig out that logic and interrogate it with facts and actually change it. INFJs are very resistant to that. Right. Um, they they have that inner stuff inside, and really They're almost they... more resistant because you can't you. It's difficult to tell when you've actually penetrated because they'll be like, "Oh yes, yes, like I know I do that just to to yes. smooth the re smooth the interaction." And I try to catch myself doing it so I'm not overly dishonest with people and can actually, but. But I definitely do that naturally. It's Whereas like a, the yeah. the e, the ESTJ would presumably um, uh, almost be more likely to get into an argument, not even because they they have an internal principle they're fighting for, but literally just because. From my perspective, it's like they're just asserting dominance or something. Like it, it's yes. more, and I'm like, yes, uh, it'd be one thing if you had an internal principle that I could that I could maybe try to, but you're just arguing because you want to argue and I, I can't deal with that. I cut you off though, but- um, No, 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 but that, that's exactly the point, right? It's that, yeah. um, whereas the INFJ is almost like the oily pole, right? They have an <laughs> iron rod and they're yes. covered with oil, so you can't quite get a grip on it because that's yes. not gonna change. For the ESTJ, it's, yeah, it's it's that they are interrogating uh, out, externally but internally actually quite soft and actually quite yeah open. and really Almost like a do. like an army of like an army of ants but each of the ants yeah. is carrying like a shield or something so they can build different walls of shields but they move around wherever they want to and it's like you have no principles you're a psychopath i'm just kidding estjs if you're watching i i love you in principle <laughs> But essentially, they they are interrogating the praxis of truth formation, right? Without actually having the point of truth themselves, right? Right, because they are more likely to interrogate. Well, how did you come to that opinion? Like, is are you a trustworthy source? Because I know that I I have often I remember somebody finally explaining this to me, and and it's exactly what you're saying now. Because I remember being frustrated about well what. Because, you know, I would be like, well, I know all of these things about about typology or about philosophy or anything. I know I, I, you know, have all of this knowledge. Why do I need a degree to show off to people? I should be able to just demonstrate my my this is sort of more younger, naive me. Like, why should I have to go through school when when, you know, and and knowing that that in particular, just sort of intuitively knowing ESTJs would be the most likely to be like, are you a doc? Are you Dr. Pierce? Are you Professor Pierce? Like, and being like, why does this matter to you? And it's like, well, someone had someone actually mentioning, well, it's because there's so many people who are proposing that they have knowledge. They need some way in order to 
differentiate between them and decide who they're going to listen to first. And, and it's exactly that kind of thing you're saying where it's like they are, they don't have the benefit of that NI, which just sort of tells me unconsciously which of these possibilities is more likely to, even though I don't know, they have to actually go through objectively. And so it's like, well, I'll start with the people who at least have a degree because then at least I know they've gone through this, this whole process. Right. And there it's weird. It's like, there's something about that, that bugs me, even though it makes sense. It's so interesting. They know, they know that person is more likely to be right because they've gone through a process to acquire yes. more experiences from other people who have likely acquired more experiences. Yes. If I have to choose to trust, to trust some sort of knowledge, I'll trust them. But right. if you were to give them the right answer, they looked at it and think, well, why is that the right answer? I haven't seen that being applied. I right. don't think that actually works. Um, they, uh, uh, but if left to their own devices, <sighs> they do trust what they have tested and they have seen, and they tend to be quite confident in that. Uh, I they, they do trust their own experiences. Yes. I, I want to jump in, and I'll probably need to get off in, in another few minutes, but I... I um... I've got like 15 minutes actually, but, um, but, uh, I, oh, this is, this is juicy. So, cause the image that cropped into in my mind, again, the image that cropped up in my mind, very introverted intuition, I suppose, but, um, is it's almost like you have the INFJ, um, who's like, I use that, I use that, uh, nickname, the Hierophant, like the high priest or something. And they've got like their temple, right. Where they bring people in and they, and they teach them or possibly indoctrinate them in their their viewpoint and they lead them through the stages of like we will i will take i will wash you i will take away these things and um and then you have the estj who's outside in like the marketplace or something and this is a which i'll, I'll get to that in a moment because i i i did play around with the notion and i'm not i'm still not sure about it but before choosing the name the anarchists i had played around with the notion of um the plutocrats, which I knew wasn't going to go over very well with the NFP types because of the capitalistic notions. But the reason that I had that notion, and I, I think it's very problematic, but the notion of a marketplace of ideas where yeah. everybody has their own stall or and you, anything you can pay money to get, um, or just it's more of just an intuitive notion if only just because it, it separates it from, from the INFJ hierophant, like this almost religious notion going on, whereas the, the ESTJ has no time for that. It's mm -hmm. like, how, why should I trust that you have received revelation from your God or something, you know, to, to tell me what to do? I'm going to listen to the money which you have earned, right? That you have gone through the, the I know it's not a perfect example, but I, it's like I can almost recreate that, um, that tension um, between the two from that of like the, you, the hierophant is like, you are desecrating my temple, you know, and, and, uh, how, how dare you? And it's like, no, I, you know, get a real job. You, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's, I guess the tricky part is the crat. Ah, because of the implication of ruler from that Power. word. Force. Ah. Yes, exactly. Democrat, power of the people, aristocrat, power of those who are higher, Plutocrat, right. power of the, of the wealth. Um, and yes, crass, it, it, it comes this idea of, of force, of strength, of might. Right. Um, and this idea that for these type, for Delta types, they are the most, you know, the most questioning rather than ah. they're the ones who are most like, well, in, in a way, the reason Delta is actually, if you look at, for instance, look at the whole coronavirus situation. The right. ones most likely to actually shut up and do what they were told were actually the Deltas. Really? Oh, well, oh, well, yes. I, I, I said really just going off of the principles we were laying out earlier, but that is my observation. I... Mm -hmm. I but calling yeah. them the anarchists and then having that. So what's your explanation of that then? Because they're the ones who are most likely to say, well, who am I to know any better? Ah, uh, oh, oh, okay, right. Because I have definitely know, like, and I have experienced this too, like mm -hmm. to an extent, which I was like, why am I having it? But like 
feeling this frustration, and I've definitely seen it in in Aristic with gammas, and I've also seen it with with betas, though they're usually not as loud about it. But mm. this real this real feeling of like but why should I trust you? I'm having my, I'm looking around and observing and I have my ideas about this. Um, oh, that like really, really disliking the, um, oh, the claim, the claim to authority that is not based on you telling me an idea that makes my mind go pop or go snap. Like I want to hear that philosophical, like you explain to me, and show me, and then mm. my mind connects the dots, and now you have a convert, and a, probably a very zealous convert. Yeah. But, but the notion, like there is a natural resistance. Mm. I don't know how far I would take this. I could maybe go too far, but I had a little brain spark there that I thought was very interesting because I I have definitely noticed that that tension where it I you I've seen. Type people who I would definitely consider NFPs or or STJs definitely, where they're they're very frustrated with yeah. how why would anyone be so stupid to question these things? Like it's not a big deal. Like just like these are the they are the authorities for a reason. Um, and I'm sure there's there's exceptions to that. But seeing seeing that in me being like, well, I'm following the regulations, but somehow the way you're arguing about it is driving me crazy because it's like, well, but what if they're wrong? I, I don't, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, but, but, but it's kind of that. It's for for the NFPs and uh, well, NFPs and STJs are the ones who are least likely to think, well, well, I have the right answer. Right. Right. And, and they're so driven to be, rather than world changers, self-growth people. Right. So they're going to be going to say, I'm going to, what, what all these experts are coming together and saying, I need to keep myself open to and receptive to and able right. to listen to these different perspectives and understand different ways of doing things. So I'm, I don't want to be someone who, you know, is going to start to say, well, no, I think I'm right in telling you that actually you're wrong and I'm not going to do that. I need to be open right. to the fact that I don't know. And so I should just in case do all these nice things to be, to protect the people around me. Right. Right. Ah, interesting. It, almost that it, it, a natural intellectual humility um, involved there, which you, yes. which is much harder for, for, Betas and aristocrats, I suppose, I, I I guess especially hard for aristocrats. I don't know who who would be worse off, but I it, it's I'm thinking in terms of that ni, um, but because uh, I do think aristocrat is bang on the money. Okay, of being the having the most trouble with that sort of thing. Oh, or, or, or more just just being aristocrats. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. I think it's a pretty good word to sort of fully encapsulate that that notion. I also do like theocrats. Um, I think that mm -hmm. that works rather nicely for the, um, at least for the NFJ types. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but yes, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. But I mean, because I think there's there's an idea that they that the beaters feel they have almost a noble quality to them. Right. That there is something about them that has a sparkle, an ineffable quality. They can't right. describe. That means, no, no, I am on a plane that matters. And some of these people aren't on that plane that matters. Right. There will be some people who are also on the plane that matter with me. These are my fellow aristocrats. Right. And right. You, can't, you can't base that in anything factual. It's just a, a, a thing, a sparkle. Um, right. Which... We just makes them above, and so, and 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 we know that thing is there because so many beaters become celebrities because right. they because of the idea they attract the idea of actually being this more noble class. It's celebrity culture is a very much an American thing. It's because they stripped away the formal aristocracy. Right. And what happened is that the beaters eventually erect their own aristocracy, <laughs> which is the new celebrity. Um, right. 
overrepresented. When I go do typing, so many people are especially beta extroverts. I've right. got more beta extroverts than any uh, hundreds of examples and only a few examples of deltas. Right. Uh, Harrison, because they're the ones who show up on that more public consciousness. They do things to show up. Right. The delta is almost accidental. <laughs> like on, genuinely accidental. Like, in the case of um, the late queen, Elizabeth the Faithful, an accident right. of birth. Right. I, I know very little about, about, about the queen, I'm afraid. So I'm actually not sure what you were referring to. No, the, no, worries, but she's I, very Delta. Very. Okay. Obviously, I knew that she, she had passed away, but uh, no worries, interesting. Hmm. I know we're at sort of like the five minutes before we finish. Are there anything, any last thoughts, Michael? I know you said you needed to leave soon. Yeah, I, I, this is probably a good a good point to hop off but um no this is great uh i don't i don't think i have any th more thoughts at this point but i definitely want to um i will be very i'm very excited to uh see uh see you come out with your course um i mean obviously it, it i i uh, i'll uh, pay for it of course <laughs> but, or or just get get um I, i'm very excited you're doing that is all i'm trying to say um, it, it's it's already in the process, as in yes. the, the, the head's out. Right. The, 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 the head's <laughs> yet followed. But the, the point is, you can already, if you'd like, see the recordings. Oh, it's going to be right. a bit more messy than the, the finished product because it's sure. private version, but people are paying to see that. People are paying a reduced price, even of right, the right. Uh, price, to, to see that. It's just 180 quid. Um, and yeah, to see, to basically mean that to entitle them to what will be 16 weeks worth of content. Right. So, yeah. Feel free. If you want to see that, I'd be more than glad to, um, yeah, to send that to you so you can keep up with the rest of us as we go through. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Um, uh, uh, why am I hesitating? Um, this is a great way to end the video with me seeing uh, a whole bunch, but <laughs> I, I'm very interested. I just I felt bad about the implication of like that I I would be declaring openly to everybody that I <laughs> that it would be for free or or something like that. So I was like, well, of course I'm going to to, to we'll pay. Talk we'll talk about it privately. I'm mindful. I'm just mindful that 17 people are watching. I can always do with more people paying to see my course if anyone else wants to see it. Honestly, <laughs> no, yeah, I, I've got to afford nappies now and other sorts. Of yes, yes. You, you, oh, uh, you've got that know. coming up. Yeah, it's the first match you mentioned on here. Yeah, my wife's pregnant. So, yeah, yeah you've been watching. So, yeah, gonna, we're going to have a baby 13 weeks in. So, yeah, that that's um, – thank you, thank you. I've, I've been uh, – I said I've been very creative these last few weeks and also procreative. Uh, <laughs> very nice, very nice. All right. Um, someone has a question. Zaya Dali. Oh. Have the, have the British voted for a new king of Britain? They haven't voted on a king since the the Anglo-Saxons before William the Conqueror. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons did the whole voting thing, but since the arrival of the Normans in 1066, it hasn't been a, a voting thing. It's been um, a, a primogeniture thing. Um, yeah. Um, what else? Another question from Lita. Do you consider yourself an NITI subtype, Michael? Oh, um, I, I, I know what you're, I've never uh, officially endorsed that notion, but I know exactly what you're, what you're talking about. And within assuming that is a thing, yes, I think that would be, that would be a perfectly good description. I definitely tend towards TI. I always seem to have had a, a more, a, a strong connection with that even from a young age um so i i would say so if i were to choose choose such a designation it's, it's interesting i'd say this is also why i'm a critic of sort of dom turt loop theories i don't think you've lost your fe in the mix i think it's no there. yeah i just think you've I, I, that's why i subscribe to you that you've just grown you've grown no. you've developed from fi towards ti 
um, ah. rather than actually FE actually going bye bye or anything. Right. Like that. Still very much there. Um, no, I think that's true. And I do, you know, I do think I can even trace my life history as starting with NI, like very NI mm. in my young childhood, and then fairly early on, due to certain experiences, really starting to work on that FE. And then, yeah, so I could actually sort of draw it out as I'm still sort of in this in the stage of really developing the TI aspect of it that's been a, for over a long period of time. Um, and I suppose so that's interesting. But um, yeah, I, I appreciate it. OK, I think that's an, uh, I think we've kind of run out of time now. But Michael, thank oh, you. Oh, it's a it, I well, yeah, I guess I should probably. <laughs> I should probably go. Actually, if you want to stay on longer? I'm happy to keep you long for longer. I don't know. Did you need? If we uh, need well, to... I, I'd hate to leave a few of the questions if there are any. Um, uh, There's one more to see. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, I will leave that. Dis I will. Leave, I'm assuming you're referring to gifted children, and I could certainly, <laughs> I could certainly see how I could be categorized that way. Um, but I won't make a judgment one way or the other. But I do you you could you could make that argument um, mm -hmm. given some of the more official definitions that people have put forth as to what that would mean. So um, that makes but, sense. Uh, yeah. Um, so. the, the last thing thing is from from my friend Chris. Uh, she's asking um, what are the other tournaments? The other tournaments I think are decency for the um, the, the the extroverted alphas and the introverted gammas and um achievement for the introverted alphas and the extroverted gammas um but yeah it will take a whole nother like 15 minutes for me to describe them so we'll leave that for another video another time unless you guys want to join the course because we will be discovering it in the course yes all right good perfect michael thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure again to have you absolutely and I will. I apologize. There is one more question I see. I'm, yes, I'm sorry. I'm I'm hijacking. Um, my that's my fe going for you. Um, also, always good to see you, D Doc. Um, but Fayette Wind asked, when uh, are there going to be a type description video part two with your an update of your new understanding of the types? Um, I have no answer to that. So. <laughs> So maybe I shouldn't have brought it, but I, I don't have a definite answer to that at the moment. Um, I'm still in very much the formulation stages of, um, I don't think I've made a radical enough break with anything that I've said in the past to, to justify that at the moment. But, um, but uh, specifically talking with Jack has, has given me a, a number of new ideas more so than I've had in a long while. So um, yeah. Now we can end the video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. to no, no, that. it's fine. No, honestly, the only reason why I'm pushing to close is because I thought you need to go. That's the only reason. I this go. this I is true. I, I feel yeah. slightly bad, but I, I just love this so much. So I wanted to uh, make sure I, I interacted with my audience. So no, that makes total Our sense. Our audience. But. No, exactly. No, but I, I, I look forward to the day when you do have a, a set of new definitions and types to get to deliver. I'd be very curious to hear. Um, it might and, be a while, but yeah, it's all right. Um, okay, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in today and viewing at quite short notice. I might say my, my fault for being so spontaneous, but um, yeah, looking forward to a future talk with Michael. Hopefully, in the winter. Yeah, it's like a seasonal thing. Yeah, but, uh, I like this it. is our October one. I kind of like that. <laughs> it's great. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and I don't think the baby will be born by then. No, but no, uh, that'll be no. spring. No, no, no it'll right. be spring. All right. <laughs> so uh, that'll that'll be yeah. our time. Then we'll get to see the baby, maybe. Yes, but, uh, in two in two sessions' time, yes. I'll be, I might have a guest. <laughs> All right. Always a pleasure, Jack. Pleasure. I will, I will hop off, but thank you so much. Bye-bye. I will click leave studio. <laughs>